Life is art. Art is life. This is Classic Talk with Bing and Dennis, coming to you from New York. Thanks for being with us here at Classic Talk with Bing and Dennis. Markus Verba is our guest today. Markus is an Austrian baritone, enjoying an international operatic career, singing in all the major opera houses in the world. Welcome, Markus. Welcome. Good to have you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks. When I'm watching you sing Papageno recently at the Met, I notice a tremendous joy in singing. And my question is, when did that joy start? Uh, it started, uh, yeah, some time ago, actually. I think it was about, music lab was about six or seven, I think. Yeah. You sang in children's chorus? Or? Yes, actually, uh, I had a friend of our family who was a great musician, actually. He was like a hobby, uh, prof not really professional, but then uh, he was teaching in school and I began with him just like, you know, playing the flute and um, just playing a little bit piano and, and following him, what he's doing. He was always composing or doing something, something, uh, something musically. And yeah, then it started actually because he had, uh, his name was Rudy and he had such a nice motivation and he actually was my mentor until I was 13, 14, 15 and uh, he actually brought me there. He gave me this motivation. And Is there anybody stopped. else in your family? Well, Same. yes, yeah, but actually when I was so young I didn't know about that because my, my father actually let's say uh, went out of the tradition actually because my my uh, my f part my father part of my family actually is uh, is very musical because my my grandfather was a uh, composer he was uh, he was a very good uh, pianist. My great uncle is a very famous pianist, Eric Weber, who was like, you know, playing the piano with yes. uh, great with singers all, all over the world. And he was composing also. My grand grandfather, great grandfather was a very good friend of Gustav Mahler and Richard Strauss, which at the time I didn't have any idea about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, then later on, when I went to Vienna to study, then I just uh, I realized it, how important this name actually was in Austria and still is Weber. And, so uh, your mother and father is not really have a musical. Yeah, let's see. Uh, my father is uh, especially proud, although he was the black sheep of the family because yeah. he was starting to, to study the clarinet also for later for being in the orchestra. Right. And, but he didn't, he didn't want to do it anymore. So uh, he changed completely and he was a boxer. Boxer? Boxer, boxer yeah. Middleweight. P professional? Middleweight. Yeah, professional until he was 29. And then he, he stopped uh -huh. because my mother said, whether me, or boxing. <laughs> <laughs> he made the right choice. <laughs> yeah, he made the right choice. Yeah. How did you feel, though? Well, uh, well, as I told you, I didn't know actually about the traditions of our family. So uh, what what happened in Vienna? Because he grew up in Baden by Wien, which is near to Vienna, and then he moved to the south to Kärnten, which is the southern region of Austria, because of my mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were raised, my brother, my sister, and me actually without knowing very much about this part of the mm. family. He, I don't know, he didn't avoid it, but uh, yeah, he didn't speak so much about it. Sometimes he spoke, yeah, my uncle, you know, great pianist, but that was all. And he was listening Va Wagner operas, I, I remember that. So in other words, the music is always with you, even at yeah, such a young age. Yeah, yeah, it started without uh, getting pushed, right. you know, like right. from my father, from somebody else. It's just like the motivation came and uh, it's still here and will never stop. When you were in high school, I yeah. mean, did you continue to singing? Or yeah, what? absolutely. Actually, it started really there when I was 11. Um, uh, I was playing the piano and the flute. Uh -huh. And then we opened, uh, we, we actually in the, in, the, in the classroom, we all made music together with this teacher who was called Rudi, Rudi Guckenberger, great guy. And then with, when I was 12, we, we had our own group. It's a kind of pop rock group. Uh -huh. Yeah, we made uh, all kinds of music like we wrote our own uh, songs and... Uh, so you were the lead singer? Yeah, I was a lead singer and I was on the piano and we just switched all, I mean, we were like five together. It was great fun and we had it until we were 16, actually. Yeah. What made you change? Well, yeah, that's it. Uh, when my voice changed, like from this voice to this voice, uh -huh. that was in the summer. So I came back to school in September and Rudy, the teacher, he heard my voice and he was like, what happened to you? It's impossible. We have to try something else with your voice. It's amazing. So he had the idea to go um, to Schubert, actually. He said, let's try a classical song. And then he gave me the song Die Krähe. I had no idea about it, what, what kind of song it is. Uh, no idea at all. 
and we tried the song and I, f- and I f- uh, fell in love like this you know there's so much inside it of course and you know with the songs and everything and uh, then we tried more and then uh, you know I get, got interested in classical music I heard then Pagliacci and La Boheme and then uh, there it started actually that was I was 15 yeah so then you went off to college or university? Yeah, to college. To, where yeah, was that? To Vienna. To Vienna. Yeah, but before actually, I sang for my for my for my great grand uncle Eric Weber. He was at the time I think about seventy one. Mm-hmm. And uh, what did he, he say? Yeah, that was funny because he gave a singing course actually, uh-huh. not so far away from uh-huh. from my house in Kärnten on a lake, which is a really beautiful place. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, I came there, and uh, my father called him and said, hey, "Please, uncle, could we stop by? Because uh, I think my son he would like to sing. Would you like to hear him?" Mm-hmm. And we went there, and I sang for him die Krähe. <laughs> <laughs> and he he said he said to my father, "I thought that boy had a thunder stim <laughs> because he was speaking like this. So this boy has a beautiful, great voice. You have to do something." And then he arranged a contact to a very good bass. Um, which was not f- not far from the capital of my uh, from my region of Canton, which is called Klagenfurt. Uh, he was a bass. He won a very good uh, a competition in Amsterdam at the time in the sixties, I think. His name was Franz Bacher, and I began with him. And I did the first year when I was fifteen, sixteen with him. And after one year, I sang like a bass, like <laughs> a bass, very like a bass. And yeah, and then I moved on to Vienna actually. And. Uh when and your mother and father really supported you to say, okay, hey. Actually, yes. there was never discussion about it. Oh, really? Because as soon there was uh, any kind of motivation also from, from, from part of my sister or my brother, they just like, okay, that's your idea, you want to do it? Of course, we are always behind you. Yeah. There was not, actually, there was no discussion about it, mm-hmm. not at all. Only my grandfather from my, fa- from my mother's side, he was concerned because he said, what a singer how can you earn i mean you're singing how can you earn because he's, he was really down to earth he was like working in the woods and he was responsible yes. for the for for the water system of the city there so mm-hmm. he had no idea actually and he was really concerned because uh, how, how are you gonna earn money and yeah. you know yeah, i'm very concerned and he was really taking care because somehow it was his favorite also yeah. the profession is not singing yeah, for yeah. For him, was a, what profession singing? I mean, you can go to a choir to sing. That's it. Okay, That's right. I understand, but uh, yeah. since you've been singing professionally, did Eric Verba live long enough to hear you? No, not at no. all. No, he died. He died ninety two already. So 92. my career started actually in 96, 97. But he must have had a tremendous influence on you. Just needing yeah. Anything. Well, because of uh, yeah, the name. I think the name helped me also because you know, people heard me and they heard the name so you know somehow if you leave a good impression you have the name then it it, it uh, sticks to your head somehow i think but uh, now it's yeah it's getting better and better that uh, also my name right? also That's your right. name is getting quite <laughs> <laughs> also there's a bas- how is the bassoonist related to you yeah he's he's uh, he's uh, my cousin your cousin yeah, in the he's vienna film yes. right. yeah very musical uh, we, yeah yeah he's uh, we always have fun, actually, because we are always in Salzburg and then in the Wiener Staatsoper together. Now in the festival, we did Fiera Brass with Schubert, uh, of Schubert, and he was uh, responsible for the music on stage. And yeah, we actually, yeah, I go back to Vienna then in December and he's again playing with me. So it's always like, that's, that's nice. Of course, when you were younger, 16, 17, you probably, uh, you don't have anything to worry about it. You say, oh, I'm going to sing. Well, At what point you say, oh my God. Yeah. Am I really going to be a professional singer, or yeah. am I really going to be up there or not? Yeah, yeah. no, it was this question never, no, no, never existed. You have uh, all the confidence, isn't it? No, not confidence, but just like the the pure motivation uh, until because it went quite fast. With sixteen, I knew I just want to do that, mm-hmm. and uh, actually, I sang my first Don Giovanni five years later, mm-hmm. twenty one. So, and since then, I'm having a career, actually, a professional career. Who were your role models back then as baritones well, or basses? Well, uh, it was or... Bastianini, of course. Mm-hmm. Bastianini is still he's one of my favorites. Cappuccini also. I heard him still live in the Wiener Staatsoper in 96, 97. And, uh, of course, Robert Merrill also, Leonard Warren, all these guys. Yeah. Ezio Pinza. Good names. Yeah. <laughs> so Papageno has played a large yeah, role in yeah. your career. Yeah. Do you have? Do you count? Do you know how many performances you have sung with Papageno? I don't know exactly. How many productions? Hanun Kur, Han, uh, Hanun Kur asked me the same thing. Mm-hmm. He said, 
uh, Markus, how many productions did you do? And I said, mm, I, I actually, I don't know. I said, <laughs> <laughs> is there, well, I, I heard an interview with you where you said it in about, I think, five years ago that yeah. maybe by 2010 uh, it would be time to put Papageno to rest. Now it's 2014 yeah. and you still have them in the future schedule. Yeah, but it's, you know, it's the Covent Garden, it's, uh, it's Wiener Staatsoper, it's the Met. But you're still having Casino. fun. And I'm still having fun doing it. And actually, with this role, I mean, Papageno gave me so much, uh, it brought so much luck to me, actually. So. I can't uh, just say, no, that's it. Because, uh, yeah, there's something, there's a strong relation between, between us. Somehow. Is there ever an evening where you just think, mm, another Papageno? How do you keep it fresh for Yeah, all but time? it keeps fresh automatically as soon as I'm on stage, actually. As soon as I see the theater, which is full always with Zauberflöte. It's always mm -hmm. full. Wherever I go, wherever I do it, it's always packed. And the audience always reacts. And they always react. It's, yeah. And this is, uh, yeah, no, the first reaction already is just like, okay, they're with me. And then you enjoy it, actually. There's nothing to, while I'm doing it on stage, there's no thought about it. You're very spontaneous with Papageno on stage. Uh, with, and with the dialogues, yeah. that, you know, one can be a little bit free. Yeah. Um, do those moments come in that moment, or have you thought that afternoon, well, tonight I'm going to throw this in? Or... Well, yes, yeah, sometimes, uh, you know, something's coming to my mind, and then just in a moment, like two seconds before I say something, I decide. It's just like, should I do it or not? Okay, let's do it. Have you ever thrown a curve to a, say, non-German-speaking colleague where it's caused any problem with them in the dialogue that they heard something they didn't understand? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. Well, I used the same text only in, in, in dialect. And there was a tenor who was not uh, native German speaking, so he was really, okay, what's happening now? And he forgot all his text. <laughs> <laughs> he was really like, because somehow it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a rhyme there. Um, uh, and uh, it didn't work out, so, so he was like, he was like thrown out completely. So I only do it with uh, German colleagues now, sure. from this moment on. Yeah. <laughs> do you have one production of it which remains your favorite? Um, mm, I did one, actually, uh, one very beautiful one in Palermo. Mm -hmm. Palermo? Like 13 okay. years ago, which was really beautiful, by, by a uh, director, um, movie director quite famous in, in, in Italy. Mm -hmm. And I think he was also in the, in the race for the uh, Oscar, I think, last mm -hmm. year. His, his name is Roberto Ando, and he made the movie last year, Viva la Libertà. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. sure, yeah, sure. And uh, I made a beautiful production with him. It's really, a beautiful really, movie. Really, yeah, yeah, it's a yeah, beautiful movie yeah, also. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think this was one of the most beautiful. It was also important for my career, I think. It was mm -hmm. 13 years ago that it was just like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you think the current one? Admit. Yeah, N no, I, I, I like it very much actually. And from this point of view, because it's also, you know, they're playing it since 10 years. And uh, at the beginning of the rehearsal, I, I was worried a little bit, but now it's okay because I can, I can do, I can do something what I think, you know, I don't have to really stick. Well, there's some choreography I have to do, yeah. I can change that, but uh, uh, in the playing and because there's also, I don't have to stick on a place where the light has to be, so I have somebody who's following me, so it's, it's, it's okay. It's, uh, I feel now really good with this production, I have to say. I know how to, to point the text and uh, I know the reactions of the audience already a little bit better now because, you know, it's always English speaking or if you're in Italy or there, it's always different. So you have to try it out like for two, two performances and then you know how it works. Do you feel like last 10 years in the opera world, singers, mm -hmm. and um, it's things changed, for example, like how they look and how they act and uh, you know things like that. Do you think that's become a part of it? Yeah, I think so. But it, I think this change began already in the 90s. I think it's always since about 20 years something. 20 because years. Uh, mm -hmm. I did productions, of course, also in Germany, which are really, you know, Deutsches Regie Theater, which is really sometimes really difficult to take because you have no freedom at all. And the, the directors know exactly what they want. You have to do this and this and this. And, you, and then you begin to feel not really free, you know? And this is the most important thing for me. If I'm, beyond, if, I, if I'm on stage, I have to really get it, to feel it in my body and to, to you know, right. if there's a conflict, then it's difficult, right. of course. But uh, f um, what I always say is, 
what I'm doing now is I'm not doing all the things they want. And you have to say in a certain point, no, I'm not going to do this. Mm -hmm. This is very important, I think. It's really important. But it's also a risk. Because okay. I've seen colleagues doing this and they got pushed out of a production because of them. They take just the next one. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, yeah, it's a tricky moment for, for us because the cho it's a big choice. There are many good singers, I think. And, uh, well, you always have to, to find the, the right way, you know, with the director, with the conductor. It's, it's never so easy like if you would do a recital with your Schubert program with your pianist and, and you tell your stories like you want to tell them. So, you know, you have to find the way. It's just like you have to work together. But uh, I don't like to be a puppet as a, as a singer, you know. I don't like yeah. to put there and uh, not even knowing who I am or, you know, just like I want to, if somebody's offering me something very strange, then it, we have to find a connection. This is the most important thing. Absolutely. Right. It has to make sense for has you. has to make sense, yeah. Right. right. What other Mozart do you enjoy singing? Well, Giovanni, I did a lot of Don Giovanni's, and I always enjoy it. Don Giovanni is something which uh, gives a lot of freedom also on the other side. And you can do, uh, yeah, many, uh, well, I did great productions of Don Giovanni, different ones. The last one in Paris with... Uh, with uh, Stefan Braunschweig at the Théâtre Champs-Élysées, what a fantastic production. And of course, the Count, I'm doing the Figaro. You do, do both Count yeah, and Figaro? Yeah, I do, Figaro. do both. Do uh, you have a preference there? Or? Yeah, well, if you speak about like having fun for four hours, you go with Figaro. Mm -hmm. If you speak about like great moments and singing moments, when you think about the second finale and the beginning of the third act, then you go for the Count. Speaking of the count, yes. let's listen to, this is the end of your third act aria. Yeah. Uh, let's listen to just the end of it. That's great. Uh, Semi-staged is becoming more popular. Do you enjoy it with, when it's like this? Yeah, very much, I have to say. It Why? was, uh, yeah, uh, because, yeah, you have a direct connection to the audience there. You have the orchestra behind you in this case, which was also very tricky because uh, we had this problem first with the monitors, which are a little, you know, if they, they have to be uh, the same time as the conducting. Sometimes they're just like half a second later or something, you know. Right. You have to adjust this, but the, it worked then finally. And uh, I don't know, it just like gives you the space and the freedom. And you know, we, we rehearsed it very well with Nic Nicola Luisotti in this case. So we knew exactly what we wanted, like musically with him. And so you feel free and you're there and uh, yeah, it's... Uh, so you really feel the music is right behind yeah, you yeah. and the audience right yeah, in front yeah. of you. It so takes you like... That's right. And the acoustic there was fantastic mm -hmm. also, so yeah. But if I saw that correctly, the orchestra actually was playing with their backs to the audience. The, yes. the conductor is yeah. facing yeah. out. Yeah, right. It's the other with, way. I've yeah. not seen that yeah, way. Yeah. Usually yeah. The, the orchestra is playing yeah. out. But. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, the, the video camera was, in, uh, of course, onto his face. And we had the monitors in front that we have seen his face, like conducting. Uh -huh. yeah, we had so, several monitors in front of us. And I did three productions there in the Suntory Hall. We did like this. We did Cosi. Oh, that was in Japan. We did it, uh, yeah, in Japan. Cosi, Don Giovanni, and uh, Le Nozze. And you think... Uh, this has become a train, so more and more? Well, I don't know, yes. Uh, i do it next year but again. But is it cheaper? Yeah, of course it's cheaper. It's, and it's, uh, I mean, it's, yeah, I think it's, 
I mean, they, they did a great work also because it's really difficult to change the whole scenery, like, you know, it's, it's a concert hall right. just to make it work, like, uh, I mean, because the stage was quite big in front. So, and it's a, it's a big house, it's for 3,000 people or even more, I think, Century mm -hmm. Hall. That clip showed that the the top of your voice is very easy for you. Yeah. And therefore, I've noticed you, you sing Peleas. Is that yes. something you still sing? Oh, or? that was a great thing. I did it in Teatro Colón in Buenos Aires. Ah, mm. big, this speaking of big theaters. Big theater, yeah. huge theater, hu really huge. Acoustic is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, if I could, I think if I, it's, I think it's the most beautiful theater in the world. Yeah. If you speak about the architecture and inside the room, it's like, it's really stunning. It's it's amazing. You've sung in it since it's been re. Yes, 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 yes. After yeah, yeah it was uh, I think 2010, 11. Mm. After it was re. Yeah. Singing in such a big house. Yeah. Do you feel that sometimes you have to be aware because this is such a huge house? In this case, now here they met not at all because the acoustic is so great. Mm. I think my voice is quite good carrying, so I have I have it here. I have also the open. I use the body also as a. Uh, as an instrument, and uh, I mean, like you have to do it anyway. But it's very good projecting, and I can, I can uh, hear come it back. So I hear, I hear the voice coming back, and this is just a great pleasure to sing like this in such a big house, and it's like so easy. Actually, the the stage is not so big because when we I did many productions on 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 the Große Festspielhaus, for example, in Salzburg, which is like so large, and uh, yeah, so. On stage, finally, it doesn't feel so, so big now. That's good. Would you rather sing in a smaller house or a big house? I mean, any difference? I don't know. I can't say that, really. Because now, you know, for example, the, all the Mozart operas, I mean, at the time, all these big theaters didn't exist. They always had, like, the maximum size was something like uh, Theater an der Wien now, you know? Mm -hmm. This were the normal theaters. And I'm doing also Don Giovanni next year there. Um, of course, I think more or less that this is the right size for for Mozart or for Handel and uh, for Baroque and for classical music. But if you then, of course, go to to Verdi, then you need you need you need scala size and you need this size for Don Carlos, which I'm rehearsing now and uh, studying now at the moment. Brings up my next question, which is your youthfulness, which you have so much of, both in physically and your mm -hmm. energy and persona. Is it ever a hindrance? in the sense of keeping you from getting hired for things you'd like to be singing? Well, that's now the question, actually. This is, I'm now trying to, because, you know, I'm 40 now, and for a baritone now, it's, you should really make the step. And I feel that I'm ready also for, for big things, like going to Belcanto, going to Wagner, which I already did, and now my first Don Carlos, which is perfect for the voice. So, of course, I can slow down, and I could say now, okay, I just want to sing. Because actually, we singers, we just we want to sing mm -hmm. and after a lot of Mozart which is always great and I will always do it of course but uh, it uh, you have to stay always flexible and you have to be very you know very like this but if you now begin like if you do Buritani or something like this you really can you can use really you can use the whole thing the whole instrument and this is something completely different and at the end I think we singers we we are always looking for this moment that we really can just like stand there and having a beautiful, beautiful line to sing. Uh, we have to take a break, yeah. but we'll get talking more about Wagner and Verdi and all those good things, yeah. but uh, let's take a break. This is Classic Talk with Bing and Dennis. We're here today talking with Markus Verba. <laughs> 